Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is David Duncan, president of the American Battlefield Trust. Really appreciate you joining us today to uh, hear about really an amazing opportunity at Gettysburg. And quite candidly, if you've received the, the letter that we put out uh, in the mail, one that a couple of years ago, uh, I truly thought we were going to lose. And, and I'm an optimist by nature, and we always like to fight for every acre we possibly can. This was a whisker, and I mean a whisker, away from being a destroyed part of the Gettysburg battlefield. Uh, and um, e even a couple of years ago, if we were going to try to save it, it was slated to be one of the most expensive things we ever did. Um, and we're, therefore, we weren't going to be able to do it. So... Uh, the circumstances have changed a little bit. You've probably either seen online or, again, read in the, the mailing that I sent that we're talking about close to 15 acres uh, at the opening of the Battle of Gettysburg, so even farther west than Lee's headquarters. And uh, it's a very, very important site, a site that's already somewhat compromised. But if we're successful in saving it, we'll also raise some money, hopefully from good folks like you, to help us restore that property. And uh, maybe at some point even see it in, incorporated into the National Military Park somewhere down the road. But um, today I'm going to ask Gary Edelman to jump in and give us the history on this very, very important piece of first day battlefield ground. Back in time, I'm taking you back to 2011. We had a different NPS director, a different secretary of the interior, and some dude that some of us still remember named uh, Leitzinger or something over there. I mean, that dude just grabbed the podium back when we were trying to preserve a property west of Willoughby's Run with other partners called the Golf Course or the Country Club Golf Course. And this was preserved in March of 2011 to great fanfare eventually turned over to the National Park Service, but there was still a gaping hole to the north of it. I mean, you remember these days, 30,000 acres, wow. And it was a massive accomplishment, but as we went to 31, 32, 34, 50, y'all have been with us the entire way as our hair gets a little less for some of us and a little grayer, I know. Now, I think you know that before things even happen along the banks of Willoughby's Run at Gettysburg, it's not like any of the troops knew, OK, we're going to end up in Gettysburg. So there's this massive campaign, Middleburg, Aldi, Brandy Station, Upperville, not in that order, as well as a bunch of other engagements that people don't talk as much about associated with this campaign. But as you see on the right, eventually, you know, they're going to come to Gettysburg. You know, they're going to fight on the first day and the second and the third day. And with some exceptions, you know that the second and third day tends to sort of eclipse what's going on on the first day. And especially that which happened west of Willoughby's run. You might notice I'm using an apostrophe for Willoughby's. This guy's name is Willoughby Winchester. It's his creek, so to speak. It's named for him, and that's his first name. So it's Willoughby's run and appears that way on all the early maps. Now, of course, eventually they would start to descend. Here's a sideways map that shows um, sort of the opening of the battle. You're familiar. You have Illinois cavalry soldiers firing the first shot of the battle. And they fired that near Marsh Creek, four miles west of Gettysburg. And what they're going to do, you see these 8th Illinois soldiers, they're going to begin to fall back. And they're going to fall back across the target property that we're talking about today. Um, you can see it in green here when you got it in the mail. It was no doubt in yellow. Uh, and you're going to see them falling back here. Uh, and And while this is happening, you know, this is happening in somebody's neighborhood. Here's Willoughby's Run, you see, traversing uh, the view here. You can see a family named Harmon down here. You can maybe see what we now know as Reynolds Woods, sometimes called Herbst Woods, who you actually see on the bottom as well. Um, and, you know, there was a girl, Amelia Harmon, in her house with her aunt. Um, and all of a sudden, uh, along Willoughby's Run, she starts to see soldiers, many of the 8th Illinois Cavalry, um, Union soldiers behind them, Confederate soldiers coming the opposite way. Uh, looking down, this isn't the best view, but this is from the Confederate perspective. Looking down the Chambersburg Pike, they saw Confederates unlimbering cannon on both sides of the Chambersburg Pike. This is descending toward Willoughby's Run. If she looked from the top of her house, she'd have maybe been able to see Union soldiers going the other way. This is the Chambersburg Pike um, looking down toward Willoughby's run at the bottom. And there's the toll house operated by, I believe, a man named Johns. Yes, these pikes were toll pikes. 
at the time. And sometimes avoiding those tolls resulted in sunken roads and every battlefield has a sunken road. So for Amelia Harmon, you know, her and her family had been living there. And all of a sudden the troops just descend onto her property, onto the roads near her, near their sluggish str stream. And it only kept getting bigger. Uh, right out in the very year of the battle, a guy named John Batchelder, the battle's first historian, uh, actually created an isometric map that shows the area we're talking about. You might be able to see her tavern or her ridge up in the top. At the bottom, you'll see the 8th Illinois Cavalry has fallen back across the Willoughby's Run, again, uh, traversing the ground here. And our target tract is right over here where you see some North Carolinians um, over there. You see some Tennessee troops who you know, if they're advancing, must have gone across that land there. Later, uh, about 10 years later, John Batchelder would improve his map and make one map for each day, okay? So you see it uh, right here, and you can see the target track sort of in the middle of all the troops, but without troops on them right here, along the banks of Willoughby's Run, north of the Medicinal Springs, Catalysine or Lith Lithia Springs, supposedly heavy in minerals. This spring uh, had supposedly medicinal qualities to which people would flock. Um, and then we take maps like that and we make our maps. And, you know, we like it when you trust us, but we also are happy that you're so engaged as to making sure you that we verify what we're doing. So, you know, we, you know, are going to show you action that happened at the time that it happened on the target track. You see two different maps that you have probably received in the mail by right now showing some of the action there. And it's a whole lot more than on the previous map I showed you. When you really zoom in, you can get, of course, the regimental detail that many of us just love. Steve Stanley's work in action in one phase and then in another phase. It looks like I have them reversed here, um, but that's OK now. So if you're starting to wonder where all these troops come from, I want you to know that in addition to the map for each day that Batchelder made, he also made hour by hour maps. And those are very helpful. They're not as polished, but they include things like this. This is the early morning action. And you can then see the seventh Tennessee coming up here. This is the opening action. The first troops to cross Willoughby's run were the eighth Illinois Cavalry. We have good accounts that they even took position as they fell back from Marsh Creek toward Willoughby's Run. They're going to position themselves about 200 yards west of Willoughby's Run, and that's just right on near the edge of the track there. And then we know that the first Confederates to come are the 7th Tennessee. Look how Batchelder, and he assembled this by meeting with soldiers and veterans uh, starting right the year of the battle. He started assembling information and driving stakes into the ground to say what happened where. So they have dotted lines as to the path of their advance, the path of their retreat. So as Archer goes across, you might be able to see um, some uh, showing them actually crossing the creek there. But you know what happens. Here comes the Iron Brigade following in the footsteps of the cavalry that's falling back. Here comes the foot soldiers, the infantry, the black hatted fellers. And there's going to be an intense fight along Willoughby's run right here. So we have a lot more detail than the original maps you know, might indicate. You also see more Confederates coming up. Here comes Pettigrew's Brigade and Brock and Browse Brigade, um, you know, adding substantial numbers um, to the Confederate attack here. Here comes Brock and Brow coming down off of Hers Ridge, heading in this direction. And you can see where Brock and Brow's guys are going. You see them, the 55th Virginia, staying out sort of in the open as the, uh, uh, you know, Tennessee troops have already suffered some reverse across the creek. Um, a later map is going to show the advance of Brock and Brow in the woods, and then that they sort of left the woods over here. You see, and again, this is the target track. It shows uh, which uh, units of Brock and Brow have come, uh, you know, across the creek over there. And all of a sudden, here's another brigade from another division. This is Scales, North Carolina Brigade from Pender's division. And you see them occupying this whole space here, showing their routes of advance and whatnot. By now, the fight is starting to move off of what we call McPherson's Ridge and over toward Seminary Ridge. That is over, in other words, to the east. That's where you've helped us preserve so much land around Lee's headquarters and on Seminary Ridge proper. But it's just showing that wave after wave of Confederates are coming across this land, even as the battle moves elsewhere. You're going to have some Georgians maybe near there, um, near this tract as well. Eventually, Lane's men uh, follow in Brock and Browse guys and they go across the creek 
both of those guys note, uh, some of the men in those units note that there was a quarry here. You can still see a big pit and a quarry there to this day along the banks of Willoughby's Run. And modern maps go and take this information from the Batchelder maps, from the official records, such as that the 55th and 47th Virginia hit this quarry right here um, and use that to create their maps. This is a Phil Lano map. Um, other maps, of course, are, uh, you know, were made uh, within a year or so of the battle. There's this famous burial map that is going to show hash marks. Every hash mark is a Confederate grave and every plus sign sort of is a Union grave. So you see a lot north of the railroad cut, a lot of Confederate dead here, a lot of Union dead in McPherson's or Reynolds Woods, uh, some on the west side of Willoughby's Run and one lone grave on the tract that we are trying to preserve, or preserve over here. And it's one of those that's actually identified, but not enough for us to be able to tell who it is. It looks like W.C. Co. I don't know if it's implying that his last name was Co. There was a Co that died at Gettysburg, but he died in a hospital um, and he wasn't in one of the units that fought here. Um, so it's frustratingly little, but we do have evidence of, uh, you know, hospital and uh, burial operations going on over there as well. Now, in addition to all the fighting, which I would love to talk to you all about for about two hours um, that went back and forth across Willoughby's run, because, you know, the costliest fight uh, at Gettysburg between two regiments, the 24th Michigan, the 26th North Carolina, 14 color bearers down from the North Carolinians alone. We have so many great accounts from these soldiers, from Amelia Harmon, who eventually was forced from her cellar and then her house was burned by the Confederates for fear it would become a sharpshooter's den. After the battle, eventually people remembered that, uh, you know, the medicinal qualities of this spring and they made the Springs Hotel, a massive four story structure with a cupola and observatory on top uh, where you could see quite a bit. It was built in 1869, very popular for a while, especially for the genteel tourists to Gettysburg. And if you looked north, in other words, um, toward the Chambersburg Pike, by the way, this building is was on the site of the country club golf course land that we preserved together along with other partners in 2011, if you looked north from there, you could see some of the structures of uh, the country club, uh, one of which is uh, still there as well, looking toward north toward the Chambersburg Pike. In other words, you are looking directly at the tra target track in the 1840s, uh, not long before Dwight David Eisenhower would play his first round of golf. It was only a nine hole course, so he'd play it twice. And on his first round, he got a 69, one under par, and he played it many times and often would play it three times, playing 27 holes. He bragged about this course, even as it was no Augusta. Uh, we even have uh, photos here, uh, you know, also in the 1940s. Uh, you know, now I'm confusing. That last picture might have been earlier than 1940s. Uh, you know, uh, this 1940s picture actually shows uh, the bridge on Springs Avenue leading toward the hotel over Willoughby's Run. So we have pictures of this place over time and we have maps during the battle. We have a lot to go by. I think you all are familiar. Oh, there's President Duncan. I didn't know I captured him on there. Uh, you all are familiar that it, it's, it's, it was not only a, a country club, but then later larger buildings such as that you see above uh, Mr. Duncan and, and what you see on the lower right over here were built. There's a um, a swimming pool. There are tennis courts. There's there's a lot on the track. And I know Tom Gilmore will be and us will be happy to answer questions about if we're successful, uh, what some of the restoration burden might be here. But uh, you're looking directly at the track, at that track where North Carolina, Tennessee, maybe some Michiganders, as well as Illinois soldiers fought in the Battle of Gettysburg. Probably first blood on the battlefield proper would have been men of the 8th Illinois fighting along this. So of course, when we knew this was happening, you know, we headed on out there uh, on July 3rd of this year when we knew it was possible. We didn't even know for sure because we kept talking to the developer. We never gave up behind the scenes, even as people are saying, oh, you know, what are you guys doing? Some things aren't meant for the public eyes. So we, as David said, we never knew if it was going to happen, but we shot a video, um, you know, really hoping that this wouldn't happen. Here's a plan for what was going to happen on this track, large um, apartment buildings that were allowed um, by the uh, easement. Uh, it was mostly just a height easement at that point, And it was just unthinkable. Uh, so we worked as hard as we could to secure this contract and eventually got David along the banks of Willoughby's Run to shoot a video. It just came out. We hope you enjoy. We've got a sword from the 8th Illinois um, in the video. It's David. It's Sarah Byerly. It's Chris White and me talking about it. Now, 
I remember David telling me it was really hot that day and we were a little late making him wait along the banks. It was it was very, 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 very hot. And I had made the mistake actually of putting on social media, what Civil War beard would you like me to uh, affect? Um, I'll listen to your vote and I'll shave my beard into it. Well, they picked the Patty O'Rourke, of which I love the idea, but the actuality of it, uh, you know, just wasn't driving me crazy. I could only see my past self sort of saying, what, what is this person going to do in the future? Like, you know, is this what's become of me? But I've had a lot of fun with it. I shaved it as soon as I got home. Actually, I shaved it into a strong Vincent first while I was mowing the lawn. And that is history. So it's gone. It's probably not coming back, but the tract is here. We hope you get involved. We'll be glad to answer your questions. Um, and thanks for all your support, as always, for more than a decade along the west side of Willoughby's Run. I know we're hitting you folks with a lot of different things uh, right now. We're still trying to raise money to save the Gaines Mill Cold Harbor uh, uh, battlefield there, the nearly 600 acre tract. Uh, this one we had to move fast on. Or as, as Gary showed, it was going to be an apartment complex. And sometimes we don't always get to dictate when and how these things happen. So um, I know it's a lot to ask of you, and uh, I can't imagine this is going to be the end of it. We are in an era of just unprecedented challenges right now, primarily because of in Virginia, especially, but also in places like Gettysburg, of uh data center growth, utility scale solar farms, warehouse distribution centers, and, and in this case, residential development, even with, with high interest rates. Um, it's interesting, we were on a call a week or so ago, and you know who's complaining about the explosive growth of data centers right now? Well, it's the warehouse distribution people, because they're saying they can't find enough land to buy because the data centers are buying it up everywhere and driving the prices up too.